Hello everyone, I'm The Enforcer, and welcome to the breaking news. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and support us on Patreon, link in the description below. Today's breaking news is that a Ukrainian attack has occurred at Morozovsk airfield, just south of the town of Morozovsk, and we were able to see video footage from citizens inside the town showing as the Ukrainian drones impacted the airfield and started to knock out vital facilities. We can see two explosions here on this clip, one at the very beginning right here, and one just a few seconds towards the end. We see the first explosion right there. We see the next explosion right there, and then the video clip ends, but still showing us a couple of the impacts that occurred at Morozovsk airfield. Meanwhile, we got to get satellite footage pretty much right afterwards, showing that multiple different areas of the airfield had been hit. We could see five independent hits, and according to the reports, the attack reportedly damaged an S-300 or an S-400, most likely hit an Su-34 aircraft parking area. We don't know if it hit an aircraft. We also got to see that it hit a another parking area, a fuel and lubricant storage facility, and also hit the runway as well. This is a fairly big attack on Morozov's airfield, and it is showing a heavy amount of damage, possibly rendering the airfield unusable for a short while, and possibly making it a lot difficult, a lot more difficult, at least for a turnaround time, to make sorties a much more common frequency at Morozov's airfield. It also seems as though the Ukrainians are continuing to try and target and destroy not the aircraft of these airbases, but the actual air defense systems that are trying to protect the airbase, like the S-300 and S-400, that may have been hit and knocked out in this singular attack. And meanwhile, we're seeing that the Russians' air missions in Ukraine are not doing all that well either. As we move on over into the area of Ivdivka, we were able to see that an Su-25 got successfully shot down today by a Russian man pad. Here's the clip. We see the Su-25 is flying incredibly close to the firing position. The man pad fires. And it goes on its way towards the Su-25. We'll see the impact right here. And the Su-25 flies off into the distance, impacting the ground a little while later. And that's the end of that clip, but still showing that Russian air, uh, air missions are starting to reach a higher amount of casualties over the past few days. As we've seen that Ukraine has been able to target and destroy a decent amount of Russian Su-25s just over this past week alone. And it looks as though things are continuing on the up and up for the Ukrainians in the air war category. As they are knocking out, like we saw at Morozovsk, Russian air defense systems, and they're also knocking out Russian aircraft near to the front lines. All of this may be in preparations for the arriving F-16s that will be inside of Ukraine here really soon, and they may be trying to clear the way in the skies for the F-16 to be able to conduct a larger and more successful amount of anti-radiation missions, and then finally, a large amount of close air support missions for the Ukrainian forces on the ground. Let me know in the comment section what y'all think about this. Do y'all think that the Russian Federation is incredibly concerned about the arrival of the F-16s and how badly the air war side of things is going right now with their aircraft and air defense systems getting targeted and hit pretty heavily over this past week? Or do you think that the Russians are not too concerned because they are hoping on possibly the F-16 having a very minimal or mitigated impact in the conflict because they'll be introduced in such low numbers, at least initially? Let me know what y'all think about that because it's a conversation that I've seen a lot of people having and I don't really know what a lot of people are leaning towards at the moment in that in that mindset or in those thoughts. But moving on from that, we did get to see the Ukrainian long-range attacks are still getting some pretty significant damage put out on the Russian Federations. We were able to get a report that a Ukrainian drone struck a Russian ferry in the port of Kavkaz in the region of Krasnodar. According to Ukraine, this ferry was used to transport military equipment. We can actually see the mooring for that ferry right here. And we can see one of the ferries actually loading up a large amount of semi-trucks to transport over to the city of Kerch. This is exactly the mooring that we believe this ferry has been hit in. And we've already heard from Russian local authorities that several may have been wounded and killed in that attack on the ferry. We cannot confirm that at the moment. 
But what we can say is that this attack will most likely once again start to put heavy strain on the already largely knocked out Russian Kurch Strait crossing, and we will most likely see that the Russians are in panic mode about how in the world are they going to be able to keep the Crimean Peninsula running, uh, considering that it's very difficult for them at this point from what we understand. Meanwhile, moving on out of that news and inside of Moscow, we were able to hear that they're already in panic mode in the government about what's going on with Russian refined fuel products, as they have banned all gas exports again outside the Russian Federation, as the price for different kinds of gas has skyrocketed 44%, and there are publicly admitted shortages of different qualities of gas, including 95 and 92. And we've been able to hear that traders inside of the Russian Federation are saying that there are chronic shortages of certain kinds of gas. This means only one thing. The Russian economy is most likely going to start moving into a heavy state of stagnation or backslide because the transportation of basic goods and therefore the continuation of any kind of a consumer economy will begin to decline in the face of the unavailability of any kind of refined gases. Ukrainian drone attacks have been wildly successful so far in knocking out a sizable enough amount of Russian refining abilities that the Russians even buying large amounts of foreign gas imports are not able to keep enough usable fuel products within the Russian Federation to keep the economy running. It is an act of desperation by the Russians to try and start banning gas exports again from the Russian Federation, and it's once again showing that their gas infrastructure or gas logistics is in its death throes and most likely will not be able to last that much longer. Most likely several months, but even then, that might be pushing it as other kinds of gas will most likely start to get run out in numbers and availability and we'll start to see that Russian agriculture and Russian commercial industry and industrial activities begin to grind to a halt because of the lack of gas. Meanwhile, inside of Hungary, their problems also pertain to the availability of gas. And we are starting to hear that because of this, Hungary is blocking Ukraine war support again inside the European Union. We got to hear that Hungary and Slovakia have initiated the conveying of a European Commission committee due to Ukraine's termination of Luke Oil Transit through the Druzhba pipeline. To put this in short... Hungary and Slovakia have still been getting Russian gas, it's most like, mostly natural gas, but also some refined gas products from the Russian Federation through a Ukrainian pi well, a pipeline that runs through Ukraine from Russia to Hungary and Slovakia called the Druzhba Pipeline. Ukraine has recently shut down the Druzhba Pipeline, once again wanting to conduct economic warfare against the Russians, which seems to be one of their most successful actions so far during this year. This is of course going to be impacting Hungary and Slovakia negatively, and it now seems as though Hungary is taking it upon themselves to once again spearhead the actions against Ukraine and against Ukraine support going on into the future because they're going to be negatively impacted by this Ukrainian action against the Russian Federation. Meanwhile, things don't seem to be going all that well or all that peacefully for Ukrainian vessels and maritime shipping inside the area of the Southern Red Sea. We were able to see that the Ukrainian vessel transiting the area today ended up coming under attack from a Houthi drone, and we got to see the Ukrainian forces on board using FAL rifles were able to engage and destroy the Kamikaze boat just dozens of feet away from the ship nearly being hit and sank, most likely from the explosion. We see the explosion right there. Okay, okay, okay. Video, блять, video, video. Взорвали, взорвали его. Good job, блять. And that's the end of the clip, but very good to see that they were able to knock out a Houthi drone that was attempting to target and hit uh, Ukrainian merchant shipping traveling through the Red Sea and most likely back to Odessa inside of Ukraine. Meanwhile, in the northern area of the Middle East, tensions in between Hezbollah and Iranian-backed proxies in the nation of Israel is continuing on as we were able to see that Hezbollah fired rockets overnight once again into northern Israel, and the Iron Dome, of course, was ready to intercept, knocking out all incoming air targets, but still showing that tensions within the region are wildly high. Yo.
we now hear all the successful impacts finally reaching the cameraman. And that's the end of the clip, but still showing that hostile actions are continuing within the area. A fairly uh, reoccurring norm at this point, but still showing that there will most likely be some sort of more larger and more severe action coming out of the area. It may only be a matter of time. We have seen that Israeli forces have continued to build up in size along the southern Lebanese border, but we've not been able to see any offensive actions occurring yet. We are still expecting that that will eventually happen. It's just that we don't know exactly when that would happen at this point. We will be continuing continuing to await the impending Israeli invasion into southern Lebanon, which we assume will most likely happen by the end of this year, uh, although we don't know exactly when. I want to make that incredibly clear. But moving on from that and all the way over into China, we were able to hear that apparently Ukraine is doing something that uh, we have talked about a little bit on this channel and we have uh, showed some open disdain for, but it appears that Ukraine is continuing forward with these actions nevertheless. Dmitry uh, Dmitro Kubala, the Ukrainian foreign minister, by orders of Zelensky, has arrived in China to start speaking to the Chinese, and I quote, about a peaceful resolution to the end of the war in Ukraine, with the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi. This is something that is very interesting, and we have talked about a little bit on this channel in the past. We have spoken at length about the Ukrainian attempts, especially by President Zelensky, to create a diplomatic uh, connection from Ukraine to China. We have talked about this a great deal, and many people are saying that the Ukrainian-Chinese relationships are nothing that bad. I am going to say, on the other hand, that Ukrainian-Chinese relations are probably one of the most detrimental and anti-productive actions or unproductive actions that we've seen so far in the war. Of course, we are pro-Ukrainian, but prior primarily, we are pro-Western. And so whenever the two come into conflict, we have to pick a pro-Western route instead of the pro-Ukrainian route as a priority, considering that most of our audience, most of you all watching right now, are most likely not Ukrainians. Y'all are most likely Westerners, either from Europe, the United States, or East Asia, or you are an American, much like myself. Um, we have talked about this, and I'm going to speak about this a little bit and explain why this isn't a good situation for Ukraine to even try and put itself in. China is a predatory country when it comes to interacting with other nations around the world. They usually do this in a very passive and very uh, peaceful sort of a way, but they are able to tie nations into China permanently and pretty much usurp any kind of Western interests that were involved in that area beforehand. We have seen this multiple times in the One Belt, One Road program that China is continuing to pursue where they will give a very friendly looking offer to a country like Ethiopia, helping them to build infrastructure inside their country, such as brand new hydroelectric dams, or for example with Uganda, completely funding a brand new state run railway within the country that will be completely funded and footed by the Chinese taxpayer, or more so by the Chinese government. However, the thing is, is that China never gives these actions as an act of goodwill. They are always brought with a heavy amount of interest that these countries have to repay. And none of these countries so far that have been involved in the One Belt, One Road program and have been given these sorts of offers have ever been able to repay these kinds of loans and debts, meaning that they have to default on those loans and they are permanently indebted to the Chinese economic system. And that means that the Chinese government has an incredibly massive sway on how things unfold in those countries from that point forward forward, making them, in a very passive-aggressive way, a permanent part of the Chinese sphere, considering that they're practically uh, sharecropping at that point in their own countries because they're having to work to repay the Chinese debt, but they simply never make enough money to repay the debt, so they are permanently indebted to China and therefore permanently forced into a Chinese sphere of influence. China, whenever operating with smaller countries than them, is always predatory. It is the norm. We can see that everywhere. We can see that even with Chinese border disputes in the region around their own country. They are incredibly predatory to the Philippines. They are incredibly predatory to Vietnam. They are incredibly predatory to India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and any other surrounding countries that they deal with that they are not on excessively good terms with or they have their own interests to pursue, if you are a smaller country, you are going to be getting the short end of the stick every single time you deal with China, even if you want to step forward to them and deal with them, like Afghanistan did. Afghanistan actually stepped forward after the fall of the Afghan government and the return of the Taliban in charge of Af Afghanistan. They actually stepped up to the Chinese and tried to pursue some sort of an economic path. But China 
of course, having some territorial disputes with Afghanistan did not offer them economic support. And instead, they are close to going to blows right now in the very small border region that Afghanistan and China share right here. They're about to go to blows over an area as small as that. And it is showing that whether you're on the economic good side or the passive good side or the aggressive good, uh, side of China, it is not good to be a smaller country dealing with China. And Ukraine is a small country. Of course, Ukraine has been massively inflated over the course of this war to make it sound like it's some sort of a massive powerhouse. But the reality is very different. Ukraine has an incredibly small GDP of around $300 billion pre-war compared to just neighboring countries like Poland with an economy of around $900 billion US dollars. Ukraine is fairly uh, is a fairly small fry on the economic sense. And for that reason, it's a lot easier for countries to push them around in the global world than it is for Ukraine to leverage anything that they have. And Ukraine and China's relationship is one that already is more so China-centric than Ukraine-centric at the moment. The only solid or physical uh, connection that Ukraine has with China is Ukrainian grains. A large amount of Ukrainian grains actually end up making their way all the way from Ukraine into China, where they're purchased by the Chinese at incredibly cheap prices. Ukrainian grain is quite numerous in volume, and it's also wildly inexpensive, especially compared to grains that are available inside of the Western world, for example, inside of, uh, inside of the entirety of Europe. And that's why we saw that back in the day countries like Poland would completely ban the importation of Ukrainian grains because the pricing was practically predatory. Ukrainian grain would always undercut local farmers inside of Poland, and therefore those local farmers started to run into financial destitution because they weren't even able to sell their crops onto the open national market or the open European market because it was always being undercut by the cheaper Ukrainian grain. This means that Ukraine at this point is forced to pretty much sell their grain to China. China, while buying Ukrainian grain, isn't tied down to Ukrainian grain. China is a wealthy enough country that they could easily switch from Ukrainian grain to another kind of a grain somewhere else in the world that is maybe a little bit more expensive, but nevertheless in the quantities they need. And this means, especially because of the economic disparity in between Ukraine and China, Ukraine is inherently already at a disadvantage when dealing with China. And considering that Ukraine is now trying to have some sort of a diplomatic relation now openly by sending Dmitry, uh, Dmitry Kubilo or Dmitry Kubala to China, this is going to be something that the Chinese might leverage in the future. And this is going to start undermining everything that the West has done so far with Ukraine. The West has given hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine in between the European Union and the United States, or really the entirety of NATO. We have given a massive sum of money to Ukraine, and we've not only given a massive sum of money, we've given a massive amount of training, we've given a massive amount of tech that the Ukrainians did not possess beforehand, we have given a massive amount of informational support as well through the Maxar satellites and many other sorts of informational support that isn't even told publicly. We have given a lot to Ukraine, and the fact that they're moving to China at this moment and they're going to send Kubla over there to start talking about a peaceful resolution of the war that's going to be brokered by the Chinese, I don't know what's really gotten into them at this point because, for one, China is openly anti-Western. Two, China has openly done things leading up to everything except for lethal uh, support to Russia to support Russia's war in Ukraine. And we've known that publicly now since yesterday, where when it was officially announced that China is providing military support to Russia that is non-lethal, such as satellite pictures and data that they can use about Ukraine to be able to not only target Ukrainian military infrastructure, but Ukrainian civilians as well, like we've seen the Russians doing over two years. A lot of that could be blamed on the Chinese for the large part for providing Fighting the Russians with that kind of sensitive data. But nevertheless, Ukraine is now going to go to China and Kubala is going to talk with Minister Yi about a possible peaceful resolution to the war brokered by them. I don't know what is what the idea behind this is. I don't mean to sound incredibly uh unhappy with this, uh, to be quite honest, I am, because if anyone's going to be brokering a peace, it should be the Turks. The Turks are a member of NATO. They are a fairly neutral power amongst Ukraine and Russia, and Russia and Ukraine could both go to Turkey, and we could get a peaceful resolution to the conflict that wouldn't appease both sides, but we could assume it would be fair, because Turkey does Turkey things, so we know that they're going to fairly broker a, a decently neutral deal, one that will be a compromise amongst both parties if it 
peaceful resolution to the war was to be sought. With the Chinese, however, it's going to be very clear that the Chinese in these peace negotiations are going to broker their already massively Chinese skewed relationship with Ukraine to make sure that Chinese and Russian interests are secured in a peace agreement instead of Western interests. So I would have to generally say, while I don't put out my opinion a lot on Ukrainian governmental actions in this war, this is a very bad idea. This is one of the worst ideas that I've seen so far. If Kubala is going to go anywhere, he should be going to Turkey. He should not be going to the Chinese. And this also seems like a very weird way to just wedge the Chinese into the the situation considering that china of course supports russia but not only that china has never really been directly involved in the war in an incredibly large way to now sit there and pull them into the peace negotiations it's incredibly bizarre and i have no idea why the ukrainian government would really want to do this but nevertheless they're trying so we're going to have to wait and see how that goes we said on this channel a while ago that it was becoming very clear to, to me uh, and also to Enforcer Matt that the Ukrainians were starting to try and lean a little bit too heavily on the Chinese and a lot of people didn't believe that. And now we're seeing that Kubala is going to China and they are leaning very heavily on the Chinese. This should be wildly concerning to everyone in the West because this is inherently, if the Chinese are going to broker a deal, going to be against Western interests and it's going to be in support of Chinese interests, which means that everything we've done inside of Ukraine may as well have been for nothing and the russian world or really in a sense the chinese world but in a small part of the russian world will achieve what they wanted to achieve in ukraine without pushing the russians out of ukraine without succeeding in retaking crimea so that way we can push the russian black sea fleet out of any usable area around the eastern mediterranean will have achieved none of that and the chinese will have gotten everything they wanted and possibly at our own expense but with that on that bit of a scathing bombshell let me know what y'all think about that in the comments. Do y'all think I'm being a little bit unfair here by saying that it's uh, it's not necessarily a good thing for China to negotiate a peace with the war in Ukraine or not? Uh, let me know what y'all are thinking because I'd be interested in seeing if a lot of people are going to say that China being an inherently anti-Western country, uh, brokering a peace deal will actually be a good thing or not. Um, but let me know. But beyond that... That is the end of all of the news we have today. I've got to thank each and every one of y'all so much once again for watching. If y'all did enjoy, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And support us on Patreon, link in the description below. Because we put news like this out every single day of the week, pretty much, whenever there's enough news to cover. And so with that, thank you all so much once again for watching. And I will see you all in the next one.